The Coyote Canyon Mammoth Dig Site in Kennewick, Washington, continues to turn up data and bones four years into the community project, and some has the potential to rewrite Northwest flood history. Mammoth finds in Washington are really common. Uh, mammoth finds in flood deposits in Washington are really common. Uh, but being able to say uh, we have six or eight floods on this site and ours is in the third one up from the bottom and it dates to 17,005 um, is something that you almost never see in literature. Even at the simplest point of view, we are generating data that doesn't occur in the literature very often, certainly not in Washington. Well, we've got several different lines of investigation, let's say, and um, my focus has been on the geologic aspects. And, and so I've focused primarily on trying to unravel the sequence of geologic events. We've done some magnetic susceptibility measurements, done some X-ray fluorescence. We've looked at um, point counting of sand grains, you know, to, to group those into different lithologic fractions, how much is basalt versus how much is granite. Uh, we've done some particle size analyses and calcium carbonate analyses and stable isotope analyses. <laughs> um, anyway, so the, the list kind of goes on, but primarily we're um, you know, collecting samples and uh, trying to piece all that evidence together and where we see changes, those changes all seem to line up with changes in geologic events that have happened. One of the first things George saw at the site was fanglomerate material, and that was just the beginning for the geologic research director. Well, it tells part of the story. You know, we have the basalt underneath, which is about 10.5 million years old, and then our next geologic unit is this fanglomerate, and it's about, <clears throat> well, anywhere between 450 and about 240,000 years old. Most recently, about 240,000 years old. And then on top of that, we have the Ice Age flood deposits. And then on top of that, we have the windblown lust deposits. And what we see over there is just the flood deposits and the windblown deposits. These are the fine grain facies of the Ice Age flood deposits that uh, came in during the end of the last Ice Age. And you can see some banding here in my shadows. Um, that banding, that's graded beds, basically each one of these we think represents a separate Ice Age flood event. And the mammoth bones are somewhere in this area. We haven't done a strong correlation over to the site uh, quite yet, but we're working on that. But these are the flood deposits that the mammoth was found in. One of the other pieces of evidence besides these graded beds are these erratics. Okay, and these are, these are those uh, Ice rafted erratics, um, they're granitic in nature. Our bedrock is basalt, which is an extrusive igneous rock. And, and so these are quite different. The other thing that's unusual is these are um, much uh, out of, they're kind of out of sequence uh, with, the, with the other sediments. So we got really fine grained sediment, which suggests that the water was moving fairly slow. Yet we have these large rocks um, and angular that are not from around here. So something else had to bring these in. And these uh, we, we call drop stones. So basically you can imagine a chunk of ice floating in on this temporary lake. And as it melts, these stones will fall out of that. And we find these occasionally throughout these deposits. And this is one of them that we took, you know, just uh, a few meters away. Many techniques being used at the site have come from volunteers and a willingness to try new things while excavating. <laughs> you know, basically x-ray fluorescence, I pulled that out of interest in looking at soils relative to grapes, you know, and, and what, you know. So basically I just, I just said, well, yeah, let's try that there. You know, it's a different application, but it's a, you know, same tool, same technique. In fact, Neil Mara. He's a co-worker at Battelle. I didn't know him until we started looking for a portable x-ray fluorescence instrument that we could borrow and take out to the site. Neil 
came to us, had a portable instrument that he was responsible for and, and trained the interns and I on how to use that. Took us out in the field, we actually did some standardization, did some measurements. There's a device called an X-ray fluorescence instrument that allows you to very quickly determine the elemental composition of whatever you're pointing it at. It's very much like a Star Trek tricorder. Oh, Kirk, what is that? It fires a very weak X-ray at the target. The X-rays hit the element and bounce the electrons into a higher energy level. We take readings going from the top all the way to down and look at the percentage for a specific element, say iron, as we pass through the different soil layers, we'll see the amount of iron change. Uh, it has a different geochemical signature as you pass from one layer into the next. And sometimes the chemical analysis will show you layers that you can't see with your eye which is uh, helpful for getting a accurate understanding of the geology of the soil that we're investigating. So this is a hydrochloric acid test with 10% HCl. I'm going to drop this on here. We're going to see what it does. Uh, I was really uneventful. Um, <laughs> so right here, I'm not sure if you guys can see this or not. There are little tiny pitted holes here and here and here and in this nicely compacted area. Um, what that is, is that if you're eating away material with this acid that you drop on here, it creates uh, little tiny holes. And so part of this is testing the reaction is to see how fast those holes form. So I'm going to drop, let's try and do this again. This is a really, really quick reaction. Um, so whatever it's doing is happening at a very rapid pace, which is why it's very hard to see. Um, but at the same time, it's a very weak reaction because we're not getting more of those holes. It's not um, making a big cavity in the material. So this tells me that I have a quick reaction, which means calcium carbonate is present. Um, in this scenario, calcium carbonate is what we're looking at. Um, but at the same time, I don't have enough of it in the material that I'm giving big holes. We're trying to piece together all different types of data sets um, kind of like a crime scene. We piece together the evidence, different lines of evidence, and as it um, converges on one story, then, then we have a lot more confidence that the story that we're painting is, uh, um, is the right story. And I think the mammoth and the mammoth bones do sort of get uh, front and center attention, but for me, what I think is really interesting about it is that the focus of the project is actually on the paleo environment and sort of what the landscape and uh, ecology was like as we moved down through the layers and back in time and especially as the mammoth bones are bedded in between layers of the Missoula flood that's really interesting they've already gotten one good date um, on the, the mammoth bones and hoping to get a few more to lock it down uh, and that's really useful information for putting together the deep geologic history of this region. Once these layers are gone, we're not going to be able to go back to the test. It's almost entirely a silty clay-based soil. Um, the fact that it holds water the way that it does and molds almost like a Play-Doh um, is just a rough, very rough uh, indicator that clay is present. It'll tell us the color of the sediment. So if you get through different layers, it'll help you determine um, where stratigraphy starts and ends, if it changes. and there's, if there's a, a lot of iron content, generally the soils will look more red. Certain, it, it's an indicator, it's just another piece of information that helps us do what we're doing. Uh, most of the ones at our site so far have been um, within this one page right here, or plus or minus one page. One of the aspects that I've been looking for some technical support on is uh, someone that can help us do a three-dimensional model of the configuration of the bones. You know, from a geology standpoint, I can put them on a map and I can do some cross sections and fence diagrams, but, but having, you know, the computer skills to put, you know, this information into a three-dimensional model so that we can rotate and look at it, things like that. So that, that kind of got uh, Neil interested 
A couple of years ago, I acquired an interest in uh, 3D printing and 3D printers. And then about a year ago, I became aware of the Mammoth Dig project and uh, put two and two together and said, I could print 3D copies of the mammoth bones. It's called a cube printer. Comes as a, as a complete unit. And um, I've got a model of the uh, mammoth skull on this little thumbstick and we're going to try to print it. So first thing I have to do is set the print gap. So there's a little tiny gap between the print head and this metal plate. And that's just a little bit too tight. That feels about right. Put the thumb drive in. That's how we want to print. So right now it's printing a, uh, a base layer for the uh, piece to sit on, which we will then uh, cut off after it's done. And this will, so this will take several minutes while it prints this base. Oh. So I don't know, it, you can see the, uh, the lines of the layers as it built up. Yeah. Actually, you can see it better in this one. Yeah. yeah. And, and so you can sort of see the remainder of that, that raft, that's what they call it. So it printed sitting like this. And he was able to take that um, three-dimensional model and cut it up into pieces and on his own 3D printer print a small um, replicas of the mammoth bones that we had. We could you know, dem demonstrate that, yeah, that is the left Humerus, and that is the left scapula. Oh, well, you know, we never even thought about doing, you know, three-dimensional models of bones that could help us in the field. George elaborates on some of the other techniques they're using at the site. There are a couple of the techniques that we have tried that are kind of unusual, and is that we've, um, we washed down all the sediment, and then we've gone through, and everything, all the sand, between one to two millimeters, we've gone through that and picked out what is basalt versus granite versus quartzite. And so we've kind of pieced together the lithic fragments uh, throughout the whole sequence. And we have seen some changes uh, relative to the strata. We've also done the same thing kind of with uh, x-ray fluorescence, portable x-ray fluorescence, as well as samples that we've taken back to the lab. And, and those are just examples of some of the newer techniques that have not been used a lot at uh, mammoth sites or in the Ice Age flood deposits. And so um, I'm excited about that. We're still working on that, the, um, you know, the finalities of that. But our um, preliminary findings suggest that these, both these techniques are, um, are useful and uh, are um, working together to tell the same stories. We have um, uh, above and presumably below the mammoth itself. Um, we haven't gotten below it yet, but above at least, we probably have a 17,000 year record of beetles, of rodents, of reptiles, amphibians, of mollusks, of seeds, of uh, other plant material, stems and things like that. Um, all of that really the interpretation of all that really requires um, George's work to kick in um, so that we know where the strata are changing, lithologies and, and textures and everything like that. Um, eventually when this material, or the material that we've gathered gets picked and sorted, um, we'll have uh, individual faunas to plug into each of these layers and be able to talk about how the paleo environment and the paleo ecology has changed through time uh, up through that 17,000 year stack of sediments to plug into his geology. And uh, I think it'll make this a critically important site. One of the things you notice immediately at the site is the variety of ages involved in the dig. It isn't an accident. 
and Pacific Northwest National Laboratory is a supporter of the Coyote Canyon site and has created opportunities for their interns to be part of the project. Well, one of the things that, uh, you know, we have a Team Battelle project and uh, Battelle Corporate has, has provided $10,000 uh, to support this project um, in laboratory equipment and materials and things like that. And they also support it uh, through their educational programs. And so we have an opportunity to uh, bring in interns associated with the, the lab and um, give them an opportunity to carve out a project that isn't re directly related to any specific project. Um, and so they can kind of carve out you know something that's unique or interesting to them you know it's a time it's a small 10-week kind of project but um, basically gives them the concept of um, developing the project the idea the hypotheses what data do they need to collect um, the research um, aspects of it and and actually folding that into a product, a presentation or a poster or something that, that they can actually present. Some of the techniques, um, as Bax had mentioned, some of these techniques uh, you don't really see in the literature associated with a mammoth site. And so um, that has piqued their interest as well. And then <clears throat> we try to develop it such that, you know, they, um, they arrive at a hypothesis perhaps with some coaching, and then, you know, the whole scientific process. Well, what data do they collect in order to test that hypothesis? And how much data do they collect? And how do they collect it? What techniques would they use? And then going actually out in the field and collecting the samples and doing the analyses and coming back to the lab and preparing the samples and doing laboratory analyses and then pulling that all together to you know, do statistics on, on the anal analytical values. And yeah. the feedback has been, I guess, really positive that they've, um, they've grown uh, technically. So, and along the way, there's, uh, you know, it's hot and dirty and dusty. And, you know, so there's, they, they learn some of the other aspects of actually doing a project. Uh, I worship them. <laughs> I, I, seriously, I, I, uh, I think that's really, really cool. Uh, they are tomorrow's scientists. Uh, and to have played some role in getting those kids turned on to that stuff, uh, I just feel real good about it. It uh, offers high school students an opportunity to get into uh, areas they wouldn't certainly be able to at most schools that they would go to. Uh, we're, compared to what a science classroom offers, uh, we'd have to be called a field lab. And you, you just don't find those on high school campuses. Uh, we have uh, three students who over the past few years have done some pretty high level work there's a young lady just starting who uh, is a high school student, I believe from Richland High School, and she uh, is going to be working with Bax on a study of taphonomy, which is studying how the bones are buried and the condition the bones are in and such, and she's just getting started. But the fact that we've got citizen scientists, you know, and students and teachers actively involved with it and it's overseen by professionals, um, you know, we feel comfortable that the data that we're doing is um, defensible. Our, our primary focus is twofold, research and education. And so we have to try to keep track of that and actually, you know, uh, measure how well we're doing relative to that. How many teachers and how many students have been at, at the site? How many internship projects have been completed? Um, you know, and then there's the research side as well. You know, how are we doing as far as getting our information out there and peer reviewed? They are looking at what we're doing and saying, wow, I really need to now start using x-ray fluorescence at my site, okay? Or, um, you know, we have a, this new date of 17,000 you know, 450 years, 
at a very high level in the Ice Age floods, okay? And so it, it tells us that, you know, at least halfway through that glacial retreat, we were still getting some very large floods, okay? Um, so, so there's different aspects of it. Oh, I didn't know there was 26 mammoths, you know, and only, you know, relative dates. And, and the other thing that came out of this was that of all those dates, um, none of the mammoths that we've been able to find are younger than about 16,000 years old. Okay, and that's kind of, okay, was that, sh are you sure? I can take uh, my research to conferences year after year and sort of essentially preach to the <laughs> choir, or I can take it out and share it with the state of Washington. And this opportunity is rare enough, doesn't come along very often. Um, that it's well worth the time I've spent coming over here to share it with the community and with my colleagues over here on the east side of the state. So, I like the little bit of the volunteer work, but it's interesting, no one else does it. And uh, it's just kind of fun to go through this and try to find something new and interesting and uh, something exotic like a little beetle wing or uh, an antenna or a little piece of snail we're looking for. and. Uh, we've, we've been finding uh, whole bugs on occasion, or beetles in that family, and uh, they just, uh, they're so intricate and so interesting that they're still alive after several thousand years. So, anyway, it's just uh, finding different things we wouldn't normally be looking for that are out there that were around in the mammoth days, so, anyways. I have got to do a little bit of everything from doing the digging over here to doing the um, wet screening and carrying buckets. Um, but I think it's most exciting to sit over here and do some of the digging, seeing what you can find right away. But sometimes you find things in the wet screen that you don't find over there. So, yeah, the little things that tell a story like um, rodent, rodent bones and, um, yeah, bugs and things that tell a story about the time, so. Coyote Canyon is unique for the research methods being used and rare because of the all-volunteer effort. But the project wouldn't have made it to the community without the diligence of several dedicated individuals. Not all of the bones stayed on the site. Uh, there were a few that went out in loads of topsoil. And that was basically how we found out they were not regular bones. And uh, the guy that owned the property where it went called my ex-husband and said, you need to uh, get rid of these bones. I couldn't really figure out what to do until I, uh, you know, I thought about the colleges and where would you find archeologists or anybody that would know anybody else that might want to be in it. So. Uh, at the end of 2003 and probably all of 2004, uh, I was pretty worried about my ex digging it up and just getting rid of it or trying to sell it on eBay or something like that. So uh, I'm really glad it got into the right hands. The first time I heard about the bones were from um, a colleague of mine I had noticed she had some property on um, the multiple listing service that was up Claude Felter. And um, having a good friend that lived up there, I said, what's going on with that property? And she said, you're never gonna believe this, but they found mammoth bones on that property. And I said, well, if I can find somebody the property tonight, would you help me put it all together? And she said, if you can find someone to buy that land, I will definitely help you put that deal together. I immediately thought of a friend of mine who, um, who's not afraid of challenges, and he's a very brave person. He's very familiar with land and different unique things about property. I called my friend and I said, what are you doing? I want you to buy a piece of property with a mammoth on it. He goes, have you been drinking? And I said, no, I have not been drinking. I really want you to buy this property. And I started to tell him about the property. He goes, I already know all about it. And he had actually knew about the original find from the previous landowner. Can I bring the contract to you tonight? Will you buy it? And he said, sure. And I knew 
that he would want to save it for the Tri-Cities. And that was our original thing, is to save the bones for the Tri-Cities so that they wouldn't be taken by somebody else just digging up and removing them. We wanted the Tri-Cities to enjoy that. If you had to describe your role in this whole story, what would you say your role was? Guardian angel. <laughs> I made sure and I, I did hard things to make sure that that those bones were known and protected the best uh, that I could. I hoped it would be a great place for people in the Tri-Cities, um, students and the public and the scientists all be able to work together on one project. And the site has thrived under the direction of the Three Amigos and Corps of Volunteers, but there is always more to be done. When you talk to the scientists in me about how, you know, what I'd like to see, we could use a total station, survey equipment, uh, microscopes, um, uh, money for radiocarbon dating, uh, money for geochemistry work, uh, money to uh, uh, pay for and employ interns over the summer to work with us. Um, that's on the research side. We could use money for security. We could use money to better the dig house and the presentation that we make to the community. It's almost an endless list, but not quite. As important, I think, as the funding is participation. So um, we make do with uh, minimal tools and minimal equipment, and we still get the job done. Um, but we can't do it without volunteers and you know people to participate in the project. So. And these things, these things are not beyond our vision. We're doing well, I think, given, you know, a modest budget. <laughs> Basically, I think uh, we can hold our heads up high at these conferences. And, and this last conference that George and I were at, if we, and I did, pay close attention, uh, you would have heard um, discussion of work by Barton and Last from Klein Connect at Coyote Canyon uh, come up a uh, half dozen times at least um, and several times from speakers at the podium uh, in terms of the work that we're doing. So 130 years worth of mammoth finds in the past. We're producing data uh, that's never been recorded before at a mammoth site in the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm.